Welcome to BizTech's CEO Conversation Show, the show where we engage industry leaders to share insights into how they run and grow their organizations. Today, our conversation is with John Lombard, the CEO of NTT Asia Pacific. NTT Limited is a leading global technology services company that specializes in telecommunications, cybersecurity, cloud, ICT, and research and development services. John, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Brian. Great to be here with you and hi to everybody watching. Now, John, uh, before we start, give us an overview of uh, NTT and its business model. Sure. Yeah, look, NTT Limited is a global technology services company. We're one of the largest in the world. We operate in over 70 countries. We have over 40,000 employees. And uh, one of the things that, that we're really focused on is providing a full stack of services for our clients. So that goes all the way from the, the global network capability that we have, a software defined network, a global data center footprint. We're actually one of the largest, Brian, in the world uh, from a data center perspective. Cybersecurity is very important. All of our cloud based services uh, and both customer and employee experience services that we provide uh, our clients. And, and very much the focus is on digital transformation and really helping our clients as they navigate their way through, uh, particularly right now with this uh, pandemic situation that we're all in, uh, and really helping them accelerate their transformation uh, as, uh, as an organization. And I'm going to come back to you on that, John. But before that, could you share with our audience a little bit about your background and how you came to join the company from SAP? Yeah, sure. I actually, so as you said, I, can't, I joined from SAP. Uh, I have been in the company for over five years. I've been in the IT and management consulting industry for most of my career. I did have a brief stint uh, as the CEO of a publicly listed company in Australia. That was a business and uh, accounting and, and business advisory organization. But really, I joined because I, were, I bought into the vision uh, that NTT had uh, for its global organization and was and I'm really a passionate person when it comes to what we can do here in Asia Pacific. Uh, I, I work in Singapore, I commute between Singapore and, and Australia, and I'm just really passionate about the, the opportunities that, uh, that NTT can bring our clients and our employees. So John, you've been in NTT for about five years plus now. Yeah. How has the business changed in the last five years under your leadership? Yeah, so Brian, when I joined, actually, I joined uh, uh, Dimension Data, it was called, and uh, a few years ago, actually, um, NTT decided globally to integrate all of its uh, international businesses that it, uh, that it fully owns under the, the brand NTT Limited. So really, over the last couple of years, we've been bringing together a number of uh, fantastic companies in the region. So we've got over 10,000 employees, and, and really the whole focus of that was to make it easy for our clients to engage with NTT. So rather than having you know, two or three different representatives from different organizations approach them, it would be one face to the company, one set of processes, one set of platforms and tools, and really to provide that seamless and easy to work with uh, culture inside the company. So uh, that's been one element of the change. And the other one, of course, like I'm sure many of the people that uh, you'll talk to on your program is to look at how we can simplify and integrate a lot of our back end processes as well so that we can have common reporting tools, uh, common tools for our clients, making it easy for our employees to work, et cetera. So we've been on not only helping our end clients with their digital transformation, but also an enormous journey internally on, on transforming our own business as well. Okay, let's zoom in on that. Your internal digital transformation, what are the levers that you've turned in, top in order to make yourself more efficient and, and perhaps uh, better suited to, to attend to the needs of your client? Sure, so, so you know, one of the things that we've been doing is to really look at the platforms uh, that we have as an organization. So. We provide managed services uh, to, our, to our clients. So these are uh, long-term relationships that we have to help them achieve certain outcomes, whether that's in the way they operate their, their network securely, the way they adopt cloud-based solutions. So really looking at how we can simplify these platforms uh, that our clients use 
but also internally. So one of the projects that uh, we've undertaken over the last couple of years is around robotic process automation. So we've, we've put in place a number of different, um, um, uh, what we call bots, to support a number of our back-end processes, because that really then allows us to uh, simplify the way that we operate internally, which means it's far easier for our clients to engage with us, and, and it obviously drives employee satisfaction as well. And how has the pandemic impacted your digital transformation roadmap? Uh, it's accelerated it. So again, I'm sure I'm sure you're hearing this from a lot of people, but we have seen uh, enormous acceleration in our own transformation that we're making as, as an organization, but of course, of our clients as well. So things like just the way we work, uh, our employees, like many, uh, are working remotely in many markets around the region and around the world. And what that means is we need to make sure that the applications that we're providing to our employees that they consume and use every day are secure, are easy to use, um, that we ensure that the network and network infrastructure isn't just designed for the office, but is actually extended to the home as well. Uh, so this is, this is one of the changes and one of the transformations that we've been going through, but also uh, in line with that, we've been supporting our clients with that transformation as well. Yeah, could you share with us then um, some of the customer success stories and stuff that you have had um, in helping them in their digital transformation journey, especially during the, the, the turbulent times last year, when yeah. everyone was trying, boardrooms were in panic, trying to find solutions to, to deal with the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple of areas that we've been supporting our, our, our clients with. And one of those has been with their own employees. And, and one of the first things that that we had to do as an organization was actually help a lot of our clients engage effectively with their employees. So, so as I said, moving that network infrastructure, that secure network, software-defined network infrastructure out of, the, out of the corporation and into the home. So making sure that people had the right access to the right applications and they were secure. So clearly that was an important uh, transformation and, and area of support. And the other thing that we, we saw is many of our clients' engagement with their end customer, I'm sure you and a lot of people listening today have had a completely different relationship with many service providers, with retailers, with government, uh, and a lot of our clients have had to change the way they engage with their end customer. Um, that's been another major shift that we've been seeing uh, as well over the last uh, almost two years. And what have you seen have been the biggest challenges that companies have been facing and, and how should they potentially ch uh, tackle these challenges? Yeah, so Brian, one of the, one of the big areas uh, is around the network. So we have a, a focus inside NTT. We call it uh, edge to cloud and providing the secure uh, software defined and agile network that really connects the devices that we're using here today or mobile phones or IoT into, into cloud-based uh, applications. And getting that connection uh, secure, uh, software-defined uh, is really an important transformation. A lot of corporate networks um, are very clunky. Uh, they were designed for a different era. And one of the key things I would recommend is really have a look at the network infrastructure that you have that connects your customers, your employees, your equipment into those cloud-based applications. The other area is skills and capability. Uh, one, of the, one of the challenges that many of our clients face is getting access to the right people with the right skills, whether that's in cybersecurity, um, AI, machine learning, and certainly a, an organization like NTT, we're here to help. We're here to provide some of those skills and capability for our clients to leverage and to use. Um, so really, really, I'd say, you know, think about the underlying infrastructure uh, and then think about the skills and capability that you need and, and really have a business outcome at the center of any of the decisions that you make. Engage business in these discussions. Absolutely, the IT departments need to be driving and involved, but it really does need to be a business-led conversation. Now, one of the things I, as part of research for this interview, I realized that NTT has made some very smart investments on a global basis 
in spot sponsorship, really to highlight some of your solutions in smart cities, analytics, and managed services. And of course, that helps you to connect better with your customers. You're involved in everything from Tour de France to IndyCar to Major League Baseball. How yeah. have you leveraged on these investments globally in the Asia Pacific region? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, so this is something that I'm really, really proud of uh, as an avid sports lover. Uh, one, of the, one of the ones that you mentioned actually is the Tour de France. And pre-pandemic, I had an opportunity to, to go over there and have a look at our technology in action. And that really is something that's incredibly exciting. As, as you may be aware, the Tour de France is a unique event uh, in yes. the sporting calendar. Every year it's, it's, a diff, it's hosted in a different location. There is no stadium. There is no fixed location. The, the route changes every year. Uh, it goes through mountain. It goes through, you know, summer, wind, rain, snow, all sorts of conditions. And we needed to have technology that really would connect, as I said earlier, at the edge to these cloud-based applications in a secure way. Uh, and actually, if you think about the IoT devices in a Tour de France, it's a bike. So each of the bicycle is fitted with a, with a device that sends a signal, uh, capturing a whole lot of uh, uh, analytical data uh, that goes up into through, through the, uh, the network and the broadcaster to a helicopter down into our big data truck. And we crunch those numbers and provide deep analytics that we then provide the broadcasters. So if you think about the, those edge-based devices, instead of a bike, it's, it could be a laptop, a phone, or a, a device in a, in a manufacturing plant. If you think about the applications that drive a lot of that, uh, those analytics often will sit in a cloud-based environment and you need that secure connection as well. So we provide in Asia Pack with many of our clients and also globally, we provide that, that, that capability uh, in bringing together those, uh, the applications through that secure connection uh, to make sure that, these, uh, that we're getting access to the right information and making the right decisions. Uh, at any point in time. So that, that technology uh, is really something that, that has sort of underpinned a lot of what we're doing with our clients here in the region. John, I want to talk about leadership because that's a really key in ingredient of digital transformation. If there's no clear buy-in from the top, digital transformation will not take place uh, yeah. across the, an organization. What are the top three things you would advise chairman of boards and CEOs of companies really to focus on as part of their digital transformation journey? Yeah, it's a great, a great question again, Brian. So I think if you think about digital transformation, you're, you're looking at how you're impacting your end customers. You're looking at how you're engaging with your employees. It's two key groups of people that any board or, or any chairman or CEO needs to consider. So it's part of that as part of that transformation, as part of that engagement, it's really important to listen to the voices of your customers. Look at how your customers want to engage with you. Look at how they're engaging with some of your competitors. In a similar way, think about how your employees, listen to your employee base, you know, pull together a group of people. Often the, the younger employees can provide some incredible advice on how they want to engage, how they want to be communicated to. So, Really listening is one of the most important skills I think any board can have when it's considering its digital transformation. But you also need to think about the underlying security. Unfortunately, we're seeing a rise in cybersecurity based uh, attacks into many organizations. So really making sure that any of those considerations are always anchored around a really strong security discussion uh, with your internal teams. And, and as I said earlier, I made the point earlier about skills and capability. Now, I think many boards uh, need to consider the types of skills that they need. Um, certainly, there will be internal skills that will be needed that will be critical, but also partnering with the right organisation as well. So, John, I, I want to zoom in on that key point, skills. So, and, and that leads me to also your involvement as the co-founder of Hashtag He for She for Lean in Asia. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, I personally believe in as well is really board diversity. Um, what have you been doing in this area in terms of getting more women to be included in boards as well as other skills? Because a lot of times boards, especially in dealing with digital transformation, you've just hit the nail on the head. Some of those skills are lacking. 
Yeah, so, so he for she actually was set up as part of uh, the Lean In group, the Lean In Circle in Asia. And he for she was actually a group of uh, executives, male executives actually, we came together because we wanted to address one of the biggest obstacles uh, I feel to having more senior women in senior roles and CEO roles or on boards. And that is this topic of unconscious bias. Very few people I come across are consciously biased uh, against gender. Everybody knows, everybody's seen the statistics. It's a no-brainer to have more yeah. women in senior roles. Organisations that do are just simply better. They're more profitable, they're more agile, they're easier to do business with. But one of the things that gets in the way, Brian, is this unconscious bias. So it's it's making sure that women have the opportunity to express themselves in meetings and really understanding the differences that exist between men and women. So we brought this group together to really have a discussion and a dialogue and to deep dive into what could we do to, to, be, to, be, to eliminate uh, as much as possible the impacts of unconscious bias and to, to have an open conversation so people are just aware. We all have it. We all have unconscious bias. It's sort of programmed into us. Um, but it's something actually that we can be aware of. And when people are aware, it's amazing the impact that it can have in an organisation. So, so that's certainly one of the things that I think organisations can really do. Uh, run a workshop, get some external support. Organisations like Lean In are happy to come in and run workshops with companies. I've personally been involved in a number of these. Uh, and it's amazing the impact it has in really opening up the discussion and the dialogue uh, around getting more uh, women, female participation in senior roles. And also, John, one of the ways to, to sort of take the, the issue of unconscious bias out of the equation would be then to do external search and selection, isn't it, in terms of new board members? Because a lot of, and, and you've been uh, running Asia Pacific organizations for a number of years, it's very much an old boys club. My friend recommends another friend for a board position, and vice versa. Yeah. So, I mean, some basic things that, um, that we do as an organization. So making sure that you have female participation on the selection committee. So making sure it's a diverse selection committee and it's diversity runs you know, beyond gender. It's, it's ethnic, it's religious, it's all sorts of diversity yeah. creates unbelievable strength for companies, but also making sure that when you're looking at candidates, you know, look at a broad spectrum of candidates and make sure there's some, a number of really strong female candidates as part, of the, as part of the program. Look, at the end of the day, you want to select based on skills, capability. You want to get the right person for the role. But really, if you're selecting based on just who you know, it can often limit just the, the opportunity to bring in just amazing talent into the organisation. So that's certainly something, you know, I'd, I'd be the first to say... I'm not perfect at this. I'm learning each and every day. I challenge myself whenever I appoint somebody into a senior role. Have I really done enough to look at what's who and, and what is available in the market? But I think certainly an area that we should focus on collectively. John, you, you've run a couple of accounting firms, technology firms, uh, public firm as well in Australia. What advice would you give someone who is new to that first big job? that first big CEO job, that first big regional head job? Yeah, so there's lots of advice I could give, Brian, uh, but I think some of the most important things that I've learned, and you, you referenced there, I was the CEO of a publicly listed company in Australia as well uh, before, this, uh, before this role. Uh, look, I think one of the most important things you can do is, is listen reach out to all of the stakeholders in an organization. They can be internal stakeholders, they can be board members, they can be key customers or clients, partner organization, and really listen and understand uh, where the organization has been. You know, the, the history of a company is actually really important because it, it often defines the culture of a business, but really be clear about the direction that you wanna take moving forward. You know, so communication is important, listening to people, uh, having a mentor or somebody that maybe has been in a similar role before, uh, that I think that is really important, particularly if you're going into an industry that you may not be an expert in. I went into a business advisory, superannuation and accounting, listed accounting company, 
And I certainly needed to listen to lots of people. I came from a technology management consulting background. So, so certainly that, that, that need to listen but I think having strong mentorship is also very important as well. So, John, I want to ask you about that. During that transitionary period, how long before you got really comfortable into that public listed role? Because it's a very different role. Yeah, look, it took me a while. I mean, I never, I never run a publicly listed company before. I was dealing with shareholders, with analysts, with boards, with just completely different processes that I was used to. So it probably took me six to 12 months to really get across all of the administrative and compliance and governance aspects of being a CEO of a listed company. And it doesn't matter where, that, where, where, where you are, if you're, if you're listed, there is you know, a huge governance and compliance um, component to running that type of business. And so yeah, probably six to 12 months, I think it depends on obviously the person's background, et cetera. But many of those skills I've taken into this role. Uh, so this role, I'm a regional CEO of NTT Limited. Um, as, a, as, a, as a region, we're not a listed business, but when it comes to governance, compliance, risk management, all of those skills are so important in, in any of these roles. So John, what's on the horizon for NTT? And we're gonna come back to NTT now. Uh, in 2022, are there, uh, what's the strategy is that an M&A strategy? Because obviously you've consolidated your businesses. Where are the gaps in your, your, your portfolio that you're looking to expand to? Tell us more. Yeah, so look, we're, we're really focused and I'm really focused now on betting down the integration that we've been in the journey that we've been on over the last couple of years. Our, our absolute focus is our end clients and helping them uh, hopefully in what is going to be a, you know, a post-pandemic new normal or whatever other term you want to throw at it. But I think that, you know, we, we are all about focusing on helping them accelerate that transformation. So that means for us, we need to continue to make it easier for our clients to engage with us and ensure that our employees see the, the you know, incredible value of being part of a company like NTT. We're really investing in the future. So we're investing in systems and processes that will simplify the way we operate. I shared with you before, an example of that with robotic process automation, you know, we're continuing to look at how we can further simplify a lot of uh, our processes in our company. But, you know, I, I'm actually incredibly um, uh, excited about the future. It's been a tough last almost two years, I'm sure, for everybody watching uh, the program. Uh, but I'm, I'm really excited about the opportunities ahead. And, I, I, you know, I just see it's there's a lot of upside uh, in, in this part of the world, in this region of Asia Pacific. Uh, and I certainly look forward to uh, 2022. Now, John, it's been a fascinating conversation, but before you leave us, any final thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Yeah, look, probably, Brian, I think uh, we should reflect, you know, we've done a little bit of that, reflect on what's been going on over the last, since sort of early uh, 2020. And I think for a lot of our, uh, a lot of our employees, for example, it's been a difficult time, you know, a lot of people working from home, the stresses of not knowing from a health perspective what's around the corner. So a lot of people have, have done it tough over the last almost two years. And I really just want to reinforce the importance of, of having that uh, empathetic leadership uh, for people watching. Uh, mental health is a big topic and really understanding um, and making sure that we create environments where people feel really comfortable talking about any of the uh, health issues that they have, whether that be mental health or other things. Uh, and I've all, I always believe that uh, our journey and our careers are a marathon and not a sprint. And I really, for me, it's important to be, you know, to be healthy, um, sports, physical health. And I really do think that is, uh, that enables us to have a long-term career. So yeah, just a shout out for people to be, just to be mindful of some of the pressures that people have been under in recent times. John, thank you very much for taking your time to be on the show. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it, Brian. Thank you so much. I'm Brian Fernandez, and I've been speaking to John Lombard, the CEO of NTT Limited Asia Pacific on BizTech's CEO Conversation Show. This video will be on our Facebook and LinkedIn sites, as well as our website, www.biztech.asia. Please like and subscribe to our various platforms. Thanks again for tuning in.